So thank you very much for attending this evening. This month, we are going to take a deep dive into sharing and visibility. It's a very popular topic, perhaps because it's not something that many people feel 100% comfortable with. And that's for a number of different reasons. On a personal level, this is my comfort zone. This is a topic that I feel very comfortable working with because um, at an early stage in my career, I was exposed to all of the sharing and visibility architecture, but introduced to it gradually as an administration, as, as an administrator for an org which had a very locked down, very private sharing model. So it was an easier way for me to understand that because I lived and breathed it every day for 18 months. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you today. Uh, so those of you, again, who don't know me, my name is Gemma. Um, I've been working with Salesforce since 2008. I started off as an admin. And since then, I have got, gone on to achieve 16 certifications, and I'm well on my way towards um, going in front of the, of the review board later this year. Um, I have had to put that on hold lately because I had a recurrence of breast cancer. So a couple of weeks ago, I was actually in hospital having a double mastectomy and a double reconstruction at the same time. Um, so I'm not working technically at the moment, but doing this kind of thing for the community just helps to keep me busy and stops me going absolutely insane at all the rubbish TV that there is. Um, I'm happy to to share with you that I was lucky enough to achieve, um, to be given a golden hoodie earlier this year. Uh, I have to admit, it's very, very hot outside, so I haven't worn it. Uh, my husband wears it more than I do <laughs> at the moment. Um, but it was a real honor from Salesforce to receive that. Uh, I've got seven super badges, and I've got 314 trailhead badges. Again, this is a symptom of boredom, sitting at home on surgery leave. And in case you haven't noticed, I am British, have always been British. And I'm based in the UK, so that's why everything's based on uh, British summertime. Um, I can help others with data. So if you ever get stuck on data volumes or sharing or reporting, then that's something that I have a lot of experience with and I'm more than happy to uh, answer your questions with. So if you do have any questions around that, you can tweet me. Um, I'm quite active on Twitter. Um, or you can message me, Gemma at archladies.com. So without further ado, I want to take this opportunity to celebrate all of our July champions. And these are women who have gone ahead and achieved uh, various certifications within the architect pyramid. So I'd like to shout out to Rebecca, who got Platform App Builder, and Kelsey, who also got Platform App Builder as well. Uh, we have Carrie and Olga, who completed their community cloud exams in July. And we also have Kristen, who completed PD1. So that's an, another string to the bow there. But um, for those of you who are looking to complete PD1, we actually have Blanca is running her very own PD1 course. And they meet once a week and we upload all of their uh, study sessions. So you can find all of, the, all of those study uh, videos on YouTube and also on our website. So congratulations to Kristen. We have Pratima Shri, who has um, achieved her sharing and visibility, uh, the very certification we're going to look at tonight. And then very recently, we had Julia, who has been studying like mad for her data architecture exam, and she passed it this week. So congratulations to Julia. And then on the integration side, we have two of our dearest um, integration study group candidates and leaders who achieved their integration architecture certifications this week. So that's a very big congratulations to Natalia. Natalia recently ran her own study group, which took a deep dive over seven weeks into the integration architecture syllabus. And Edith was involved in an earlier initiative um, that also looked into the integration architecture syllabus. So I was really thrilled to see that they both passed their exams. Congratulations, ladies. Um, if you are on this slide, please do get in touch because I'd like to get your mailing address. Uh, we do send out prizes for every certification that you, that our ladies get within the architect pyramid. So do please, um, if you'd like to receive a prize, uh, please email me at gemma at archladies.com with your mailing address and we'll get something out to you as quickly as we can. Thank you. Okay, so today's agenda, we're gonna have an overview of the sharing architecture, and we're gonna start from the bottom and come out so that um, you can understand the hierarchical layer, uh, the hierarchical architecture of the sharing functionality. We're gonna look at implicit sharing. So what's, what sharing do you get natively without having to do anything? 
We're going to look at organization-wide defaults, and then we're going to dive into the role hierarchy. We're going to look at public groups, and then we'll start looking in detail at sharing roles, manual sharing, team sharing, and some other ways to share data in Salesforce. We have a slightly different twist this, this month um, because we have found a way to make this interactive. So we're going to have a go at playing a game remotely. So if you don't have your phone on you, you might want to go and get it because uh, we'll, you will need your mobile phone um, just for um, to, in order to take part in this game. Uh, those of you who are working on this, um, who are attending this and uh, might be concerned that others might not get the link, please do tweet out and um, send out um, a link to the webinar so that others can join if they need to. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's tweeting already. That's really kind. OK, let's get started. So I mentioned earlier how sharing in Salesforce is very much um, a hierarchical thing. and. What I've done here is actually try to articulate this graphically so that you can understand it better. So if you think of this for going from the bottom up, so whenever we create a record in Salesforce, as we know, um, if you own that record, then you can do whatever you want to it effectively. Um, but then there are other factors that come into play. So. If we start at the bottom, we have our implicit sharing. And this I'll go into this in slightly more detail in just a moment. But what implicit sharing generally means is what data you have access to before you've even configured anything else in Salesforce. So this is things like um, if you own an account and somebody logs a case against it, you can automatically see it. This is um, sharing that takes place at a Salesforce platform level. It's not something that an administrator can influence. It's just something that as architects, we have to bear in mind and take into account when we start to craft an overall sharing solution in our brains. Then we go into our organization-wide defaults. And this is the first place that you go when you start to um, think about how you're going to share your data. And effectively, there are a number of different questions you can ask as an architect to ascertain what those defaults are going to be. So for example, I was in a recent, I was recently in a retail environment where they said, we've got some high net worth individuals and we don't want anyone outside of head office to be able to see what they've purchased and we don't want them to see their phone number, their email address. We just want them to perhaps see that um, hidden away or just see the assistance details. Um, and I said, okay, do you, do you think anyone outside of head office would need to see that at all? And they said, no. And what that told me as an architect is that I needed to design my uh, sharing model for accounts through the org-wide defaults. And by virtue of the fact that, that's, that there was some data that needed to be hidden, that told me immediately what that default needed to be. The second layer of this is governed by role hierarchy. So, it, and this really only comes into play when you're looking, when you start locking things down in Salesforce. Your role hierarchy is less important if everything's public read right just doesn't matter unless you're building some reports on opportunities and so on, in which case it has another serves another purpose. Um, but your role hierarchy becomes very, very important um, if, if any of your org-wide defaults are involved locking any data down, either at a read-only level or a completely hidden level. And of course, once we have that role hierarchy, we build on the next layer, which is opening up access to records using sharing rules. So you'll notice on the left, we have an arrow that says more precise, and then we have an arrow on the right that says more open. So what this is effectively saying is that when you look at the bottom, the org wide defaults, that's when you're starting, that's when you're becoming very um, specific about who gets to do what to or who gets to see certain amounts of data in the system and then as you start to add layers on so you, you you perhaps have a private sharing model with a role hierarchy with sharing rules lumped on top a little bit of manual sharing a little bit of team sharing and a bit of territory hierarchy access then your sharing model generally becomes more open Okay, so um, so on top of that, we have our manual sharing. So this is the ability to grant ad hoc access to data. 
And then we have our team sharing. So if you have certain um, people that you always work with or groups that you always work with when you're looking at accounts, contacts, uh, accounts, cases and opportunities. And then you have your ter territory hierarchy access, which governs the ability to have several people looking after one account at the same time and to implement a strategic ter uh, ter um, territory to your data territory structure to your data. Now we've covered territory management in more detail. It was the very first study group that we ever did actually in December, um, which is available on YouTube as well. So I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail today, um, but please do feel free to go and have uh, go and watch that video. So I'm gonna start with implicit sharing, and this is right at the very bottom of our triangle. This is, this is what happens out of the box without you needing to do anything at this stage. So, and there is there is sort of four uh, four types of implicit sharing that I identified. Um, two I got from Salesforce's um, study guide materials. The other two are just based on knowledge and ex bitter experience. Um, so, the first type of implicit sharing is parent to child. So, what this means is, in plain English, it means that if you own a case, you'll be able to see its account, and if you own a record um, that is sorry so that's from a, a standard a standard viewpoint um but it also means that you that only gives you, you that access as a read only so i was trying this earlier i was working through some live demos and i couldn't understand for the life of me why my user could ha, had extra accounts in in her list view that she shouldn't have been able to see and it was only when i started digging around that i noticed it was because she owned cases against that account so when i clicked on the account i couldn't change it when i was logged in as her um but i could change the case so that's a really good example of um, implicit sharing from a parent um, from a child perspective, um, this is to do with your access to child records if you own the parent. So this is anything that's master detail. So if you've got a, a custom object that acts as a child to an account, um, then if you've got access to the account, you will, by virtue of implicit sharing, have access to that child as well. So this also includes accounts with cases, which is a, a, a classic example. For, for ease of sorry for the avoidance of confusion though and i discovered I, I was pulled up on this during one of my cta mock review boards when i was treating contacts as master detail to accounts and they're not you can have a contact without an account so that's something really important to remember as well um but as you know if, uh, those of you who've worked with sharing before and organization wide defaults knows that uh, accounts and contacts generally are bundled in together now there's one situation where implicit sharing is overridden in this child parent child uh, situation and that's when you've got a record that is uh, a child of a, a child record and it's controlled by parent so that basically overrides implicit sharing and what that means is it's a different section of the database underneath at salesforce that we can't get to that where the sharing is controlled okay um effectively as well if you lose access to the parent so if you've got an account um and it gets tr and the ownership gets transferred in a private sharing model or for some reason uh, you lose access to that account you will also lose access to all of its children so cases and any custom objects that are detailed to that master record um, the third type is, is the obvious one. So this is the God access. So if you own a record, you can read and edit your own record. You could also delete it if your permission set or profile gives you the, the ability to do so. And then the other, the other type is uh, role hierarchy. So if you are a user and you have a role, um, any of your records can be seen by users in roles that are above you in the role hierarchy, okay? So if I have um, any child records, um, they will also be included in that in that roll up. So if I'm a not, if I'm a sales rep and I've got 55 opportunities uh, and I can't see anybody else's, my boss will still be my boss will still be able to see my 55 opportunities plus all the opportunities of my colleagues at the same level as me, because the platform enables him to see all of those records given the fact that his role is above ours in the role hierarchy. 
So organization-wide defaults, I've done a little demo here. Um, help, it stops me from um, hitting the curse of the demo as well, which is wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to play this and talk you through it. So we have uh, the first layer is your organization by default. So you go to setup, and then you go to your sharing settings. Now, this will only show you parent or standalone objects um, as editable for your organization by default. So we're in the sharing settings screen, and you can see a list of all the different objects in Salesforce that we can configure uh, the default sharing for. And there are three types of setting. So you have public read write, which is a free for all. You have public read only, which is everyone can see and only the owner can change, and those above them in the hierarchy. We have private, which is only the owner and those above them in the hierarchy can change that record or see that record. And then we have public read write transfer, which is for cases and leads. In addition, we have three other options at the bottom of the screen that enable specific overrides um, for those particular settings. Uh, let me just check the Q&A, see if there's anything there. No, nope, we're good. OK. So just three things to remember. Public read write, anyone can see, anyone can change. Public read only, anyone can see, but only the owner and those above them in the role hierarchy can change. Private means only the owner and those above them in the role hierarchy can even find that record, let alone change it. And then public read write transfer is slightly different because what it means is that it, it applies to cases and leads only. And it means that anybody in the system can read, write, and change ownership of those cases and leads. And the, the way that differs between public read write and public read write transfer is that often if you're if you've got cases and leads that are public read write it would mean that in order to transfer that record, you would need the transfer record permission on your profile. Whereas you wouldn't need it, it as well if it was public read write transfer, okay? So it just enables you to control who can change the ownership of a lead because the ownership is at the core of Salesforce's um, record access capabilities. And many of the database administrators that I've worked with over the years really do get quite puzzled as to why Salesforce um, has this concept of owners. And it can make things quite interesting when you're looking at, say, a service cloud implementation, because in your service cloud implementation or in a con and in a contact center environment, you often find that records aren't specifically owned by individual people. You would have that in a more likely to be ha having that in a sales or telemarketing capacity because you've got this concept of responsibility and people are being paid um, based on their activities with those customers. But in a contact center, it's less important. However, that does mean that in order to accommodate the way that Salesforce handles all of these records, that we actually may have to introduce some kind of business process into that contact center or think of creative ways to handle that um, and, and avoid things like data skew, certainly if we are talking about very large volumes of data. The reason I actually really like the way that Salesforce has built this ownership model because I think it's I think it's the right thing to do in a customer relationship management environment to actually reflect um, the uh, the reflect the relationship that is being held by the business with your customer or prospect. And really, it's a no-brainer. You want to look at an account and understand who's been who's closest to that customer, who who owns that relationship. And it also means that users can collaborate in a more structured way as well so that you can reflect, OK, I own this, but I have these people supporting me with it. So I like the fact that it ties sharing into that, especially in competitive environments where you may have hundreds of salespeople and they can't see each other's opportunities um, for whatever reason. Now. The, the key concept here is that each record in Salesforce has an owner, and that owner could be a user, a queue, or a territory. However, it's important to remember that if you've got parent-child relationships, so let's say you, you create two custom objects, one is an invoice and the other is invoice line items, and invoice line items is a child to the invoice, then actually only the invoice would have an owner 
if it wasn't related, if it wasn't detailed to another record, if that makes sense. Because, and the invoice lines would not have owners because technically they don't need one because they are children to the invoice and the invoice has an owner. And that makes sense in an, in, in an, a, in an AR environment as well because you would have the AR clerk who's taking responsibility for raising and, and um, tracking that invoice, owning it in the first place. So that makes sense. So it ties in with the business needs as well. Now what I've done here is actually try to articulate visually what this ownership model technically looks like behind the scenes. So you, I'm using accounts as an example. With each account, once you start looking at a private sharing model and you enable account teams, um, this system table is, called, um, is, is available at that point and it's called account share. And what this effectively does is creates a junction between a group membership table and an account record. So it says in this account share table, it would have the ID of the account and it would have the ID of the group, mem uh, group membership. And the group membership here is reflecting the fact that a user can be part of a group, a group can be part of a group, and a queue can be used to share account data as well because it acts as an owner, if that makes sense. So effectively, from an entity relationship perspective, what, what the system is doing here is handling the ability to share data based upon uh, group membership as well as ownership. So the second layer is the role hierarchy. And what I've done here is try to make try to bring this to life. Um, and apologies for those very, very experienced people who've seen this many, many times. Um, but it's an important part of setting up your sharing model because it dictates what it, it, it contributes directly to implicit sharing. So I'm just going to hit the button here. So to get to the role hierarchy, you go to setup, you go to users and roles, and then you go to set up your roles. Now here, this is a trailhead playground that I have. Uh, so I'm gonna go through and create a role that's at the same level as my sales um, VP. And I'm gonna create a VP of customer service who reports into the CEO. Now you could argue this is probably one of the more fun things to do in Salesforce, but it's certainly one of the first things you would look at building in your project, uh, in your implementation. So what I just did there was actually edited it and you could see the other roles. So I'm gonna add a second role called customer service manager and that's gonna report into the VP of customer service. And then we just put in a, a second name and then it will immediately show me that role, who reports to it and what, what users are involved. It can be a bit fiddly to click around. The navigation is a little bit old at the moment for this. So you do find that you have to click back and forth um, in order to get back to seeing what you've actually built. So I've added another role here for customer service agent, and then I'm gonna go and review my hierarchy. Yeah, you might wanna not show that page again. <laughs> And then I'm just showing you where, how that relates to a user. So every user that gets set up has a role. So if I edit Bruce, I can actually see my new roles have appeared and I can make him VP of customer service at that point. So then when I go back to my um, roles, you can go and you can have a look at the hierarchy in more detail. So typically, obviously uh, the owner would have a role and then those above them in the hierarchy would have uh, full record access due to implicit sharing. And then, but then some best practices around role hierarchies. Um, over the years, I found that it, the, the temptation is to start looking at the role hierarchy as being something that should be closely aligned to your business structure. And that's true to an extent. But actually, what's mo what I believe is most important is actually being able to re align your hierarchy to the sharing requirements of your org. And that's where you need to be sharp enough or, or at least add it to your agenda during your, um, your business process reviews to make sure that you can get enough information to come up with a hierarchy that works. The other thing that we have to consider with, with role hierarchies is how easy it is to maintain. Um, I've seen some absolutely formidable role hierarchies in my time with perhaps in excess of 50 to 70 different roles um, which and it's caused problems in the past for admins it's take it they lose a lot of time trying to find out which role um, a new user should have but also can you imagine if you had single sign-on and just-in-time provisioning 
as well how much data you would have to put into your um your federation service just and your and things like um um identity connect and um exchange just to synchronize uh, the roles it would take quite a lot of time so always think of your admins if you're a consultant you're not going to be in that customer forever so uh, my advice is just to keep it as simple as you can for now okay so another thing i wanted to talk to you about is public groups and i found that these aren't talked they're not given in quite enough credit um, for what they do they are pretty powerful and the reason uh, there is a reason i'm showing you them now um, because they tie directly into the next level of sharing that i'm going to go into public groups are a way of grouping people grouping other groups grouping roles grouping roles and subordinates together in order to share data with that group okay and it's typically something that um we we tend to set up um as part of the implementation but it's it's usually based on the consultant's best guess of of what groups are needed in order to deliver against the requirements that they've got and certainly from an administra administration perspective um, they do require a little bit of maintenance, but I can show you a handy way of uh, reducing the amount of maintenance that's needed for these public groups. Um, but also, I think another reason I think they're un undersold at the moment is because it's not really a topic we tend to go into when we're looking at business process reviews. We tend to focus on the more fundamental requirements. This is, this is less functional, um, more of a supportive um tool and feature so we tend not to discuss it in big detail um, but it's definitely something i would recommend sitting down with your admins and going through just to make sure that they make sense so this is here's one i did earlier so to get to that it's under the users section and setup so we go to public groups we hit new and i am going to create a group called all of sales and then I start to look in at the items I can add. I'm just zooming in a bit. So we can actually add roles, roles and subordinates, public groups and users to this group. But I want to make this easy. I don't want my admins to have to keep adding individual users. So I'm just going to add my role and subordinates, my sales roles. So that means that automatically when I add a new user, they're going to inherit. They're going to automatically end up in that group because they've got the sales role assigned to their user. So it's less admin overhead for the users. Uh, for the yes, it's more, less admin overhead for new users. Then I'm creating a second group called Sales and Customer Service, and I've just added a, my existing public group called All Sales, and I've added my Customer Service role and subordinates as well. And now I've put together an example of an individual's team. So in this team, I'm just going to add users. So this is me and Laura in this team. And it just helps to give us more of a, a matrix. So if, if I decide to share, to add, add a specific group to an account as an account team later on, then I can certainly use that. And now this finally, this one is just customer service minions. I don't want the VP in there. I don't want anyone else. I just want to put my customer service department into this particular public group because there might be things I need to share that I don't want to involve the VP for. And then finally, we have our management group. So in our management group, we're going to add in our roles, which is the CEO and the VP of customer service, and save. And that enables us to share things like report folders with just that team if we need to. OK, so sharing rules are our third layer. And what sharing rules do is it enables us to open up access to records based upon record ownership or criteria. So for example, if we have a private sharing model, so everything's locked down, only the owner and those above them in the hierarchy can see that record to begin with, the sharing rule would enable us to actually go round that, um, or that default that we've set. So for example, it's a private sharing model full of accounts, uh, for accounts. And we have made every single account private, so, but uh, nobody can see or edit any record unless they, unless they own it or someone beneath them owns it. But we have a finance team and they need to raise invoices. 
And the finance team needs access to customer records. So we can use sharing rules to allocate that access and grant that access to the finance team, but we can do it in a restrictive way. And I'm going to show you how. So I'm going to start by creating a group called finance. And I am going to go and add, because I've been in here and added a few more since, I'm going to add my role and subordinates, my CFO. What that means is it's going to involve, I'm going to show you what the hierarchy looks like now. My CFO has a VP of finance, has an AP team leader, has an AR team leader, has a financial controller and a management accountant. So that's effectively the same as adding the entire finance department. It may be I want to create a group for, a, for AR only, uh, which I can easily do. OK, you can see here that I've changed the, uh, the sharing model for accounts to private. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create an account sharing rule. The first thing I need to do is give it a sensible name. So my accounts is going to, is going to share with finance. OK, and what this is going to do is actually base it on criteria. And I'm going to use the account type field. And I'm going to set it to customer. Now, just something to show you, if you start typing and then look up, and you find you don't find the option you need there, don't forget to clear it out of the box. Because if the option is not there in your pick list, then it's not going to find it. Uh, since then, I need to just make sure that my um, my sharing rule is nicely described, so that if any admins come in after me, they know why that record, that what why that rule has been built, and what it does. And then finally, I'm going to decide who I'm going to share it with. So I'm just going to find my public group called Finance, and I'm going to make sure that they have read-only access. They don't need to see opportunities, and they don't need to see cases. I'm just going to make sure they can see the account because they just need to raise the invoice with the name and address, VAT registration number, etc. OK, so now that I've got a sharing rule there, it, Salesforce is going to go and calculate that and allocate the right level of access. And I'm going to build a second rule here, which is going to share accounts with the VP of professional services. And this will enable the VP of professional services to have a look at the pipeline and see what kind of consulting projects are going to come through so they can plan their resourcing accordingly. So again, nice. Um, let's be nice to our admins who come along after us. We'll, we'll make sure that we put our description in. And then we're going to actually this time base our role, our uh, sharing role on roles and subordinates. And I've picked the CEO because the CEO is right at the top of the hierarchy. So the CEO has access to everything in the system. And then I'm going to share that data with the VP of professional services. And I'm going to make sure they can see opportunities and cases just in case there are any um, alarm bells ringing around that customer that perhaps the professional services VP needs to understand. OK, so that's how you set up sharing rules. Now, the fourth layer is manual sharing. And you would use manual sharing just for ad hoc records. So let's say I'm going to use my high net worth individual um, example for that. So let's say head office can only are the only ones who can see um, that Mr. Celebrity has bought um, an entire wardrobe full of sh full of suits. Um, but actually, this particular person has been going to the same shop, um, the same branch of the, of the store regularly. So the store manager needs to be able to see that data. You, that's something you could use manual sharing for because there's, it doesn't happen often enough to justify needing a rule or a team or anything like that. So let's have a look at that as an example. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't work in Lightning. So you will have to switch to Classic, unfortunately. But that's just at the time of recording. So we go to the account, we look at sharing. And what this also does is gives us the advantage of understanding who's got access to that record and why. So you can see, if I just pause for a second, that the VP, the role, the person in the role of VP professional services can see this account on a read only basis because there is a sharing rule that allows him to do that. Then we have Eric, Gemma, and John. 
Eric can see uh, the owner because he because it says associated record owner or sharing. Now, this is an example of implicit sharing kicking in. He obviously has some cases on there. So that's why he can see the account. Then we have Gemma. Gemma is the owner of the record, so she can do what she likes to it. And then we also have John Williams, and he has read-only access to the account for the same reason that Eric does too. So he obviously has some cases against that account as well. Okay, so we're gonna add a new member and we can add a public group, a role, role and subordinate and user. But this time we're just gonna add Laura as a manual and we're gonna give her read-write access to accounts and, and opportunities and read-only access to cases. Done. Simple as that. So now she's got one off sharing and you can see on the right, the reason for her having access is manual sharing. So the next type of sharing, we're getting near the top of the triangle now is, is team sharing. And we use this a lot um, in my first role because we had a private sharing model, um, but we wanted to be able to reflect where there was pre-sales support being allocated to uh, an opportunity, but also um, be able to grant access to that data to the people to the right people. So it's a team sharing represents a structured collaboration on different records, and those records are account teams, sales teams, and case teams. You can't have teams for custom objects, um, and you must switch on account teams first before you can use it. It doesn't work straight out of the box. Luckily, it's just a case of going to a page, ticking a box, and clicking save, and that enables it straight away. Um, there is also another less um, talked about feature, which is called default account teams. And um, the use case for that is when you have pair ups. So in this private sharing model, we had um, a pod system. So we would have one salesperson out on the road and we would have one person uh, based in the office all the time who would provide um, backup support. And it tended to be the larger spending customers, not the strategic ones, but, one, but ones that you wanted to make, make your team available for. So again, because this private sharing model, um, technically the on the road sales representative would own the account, but then she, she would have a partner based in the in the office and he would be on her default account team. So what that meant was any records that she owned, he also had access to because he was on her default account team. So let's have a look at how that works. So to go to account teams, we have to go and switch it on. So we just hit enable account teams and then we save it. And then we tell it whether we want to see the related list that says account teams on the account record itself. And then we can actually go ahead and define some roles as well. So we, you could see, you could add someone to your account team as a channel manager, an exec sponsor, a sales manager, a sales rep, a lead qualifier. For this case, I'm just gonna add an IT support function. And um, certainly if there's any installation that's needed, any professional services, uh, we can add that as well, which I've just done. And then what we can do is we can go and look at the actual account record and the user. And I think this is where I actually click on the user and find that I can't add a default account team member, but I wish I want to show you the related list anyway. So if you so if Eric has anybody on his default account team, you can see them there in the related list straight away. Okay, what I'm doing next is actually going ahead and enabling team selling as well. And this is this is slightly different. This is basically enabling the same functionality, but for opportunities as a separate entity. Okay, and the next thing to do is to go and look at some data. So let's go and find an account. So we hit accounts. And we go to Acme. And you'll see that there's a related list called account team. And you can go ahead and add a team member, any team member you want in any of the predefined roles that you want. So if I want to, I can add an exec sponsor and I can define what level of access they should have to related items like opportunities and contacts. And then the basis of the access as well. So if it's read, write, read only or private, and then we save it. And what that means is Gemma now is on the account team. It doesn't matter that Gemma's a system admin, but if she wasn't, she could go and add that. Okay. 
So the next thing to do is to go ahead and add a default account team. So we go back to the user. And we're going to go and add to Laura. We're going to give Laura a default account team member. And we can add any user that we like, basically. So here is where you can add your various, pop, your various partners. Um, and then define whether or not you're going to add the default account team to any accounts that you create, that the user creates. So if um, Laura goes ahead and creates an account, because Gemma's on her account team, she automatically gets added um, as a, as a um, sales manager to all of her accounts and opportunities that she might be working on. Okay. So the other thing here as well is I'm going to change the owner from Gemma to Laura because I want to show you that Gemma's being added to that account team because she's on the default account team. Let's go to related and scroll down. And there's Gemma in the role of sales manager, which is what we just defined as well. So what happens if we go ahead and change the owner again back to Gemma? Well, Gemma doesn't have anyone on her account team. But she now owns the record. We're going to refresh, but she's still she's still there as a as a team member. So we go ahead and refresh. And as you can see, that team member stays regardless of who is owning that record. So that's where it's um, that's an important thing to remember if you're changing ownership as well. So some other ways to share. Um, there is a good list. So uh, obviously you can share data through territory management and we have a separate study group that you can make reference to where we've, did, where we've covered this. Um, also last month we did a community sharing and visibility study group and we talked about external sharing in that session as well. So if that's an area of interest for you, we take a much more detailed dive into that through that video. You can also share through profiles and permission sets. You can use the view all data uh, permission um, which I would say just be very careful of. You can have view all and modify all per object within that profile and permission set as well. Um, I would typically use those for individual groups of users which need an override. Um, so for example, if finance needed to see every single account, not just customers, then you could, you could just take view all on a permission set for them. We also have manager sharing. I use this during my time at Financial Force for sharing timesheets. So, for example, if you've got things that are timesheets that are set to private and um, a manager needs to approve them and approval means updating fields and so on, you could actually tick manager sharing in order to override any, um, any, any privacy on that um, and enable the manager to um, approve that record without any fuss at all. Um, Apex sharing, that was another item on our topic vote, actually, was programmatic sharing. Um, that one we'll keep for another day, but I'm glad we covered the architecture today because the share tables become quite important for Apex sharing. Um, a good use case for Apex sharing is if um, there's a requirement to have just, temp just a temporary level of um, access for an individual group of users um, to a record. So, for example, they need access to it for a week. You might use Apex sharing for that. Another use case is for Apex sharing is if you want to share uh, with a user who's in a lookup field on your record as well. Another option is to use the data loader. I have done this before to load sales team members. Um, you can actually cr prepare a CSV file and load straight into the object share tables in order to open up the sharing. Uh, nice back doorway, um, just be careful. So let's take a look at how that would look in, print, in, in an actual system based on the settings that you've seen today. So logging into Salesforce, uh, we're logged in as myself, who's an administrator. And I'm going to create a new account. And this account is called Hello Friend. Spelled correctly, of course, eventually. And then we're going to set the type to being a customer, a direct customer. So we're going to save that. And at the moment, because I'm a system admin, I can see everything. But I'm also positioned at the top of the hierarchy. But you can see, because I created that record, I own it. So I'm going to go ahead and log in as Laura. And Laura is um, 
sorry, Gemma's on the CEO level. Laura is an AR clerk, so she rolls directly into the uh, CFO, who is underneath the CEO. And as you can see, when I click Hello Friend, I can see it because I've got a sharing rule that enables me to see accounts um, that are marked as customers. But I can't edit it, as you've just seen. There was a big fault came up and said, you can't change this. You haven't got the right permissions. So I'm happy with that. That's worked. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the type to a partner. And what should happen here is that because it's a partner account, Laura shouldn't be able to see it at all. The only sharing she's got is for customer accounts because she's in finance. So let's have a look and see what happens when Laura logs in and tries to look at Hello Friend. There's a recent item, so it's still in her recent items list, but then when she clicks on it, she can't. she's not allowed to see it. And it doesn't appear in her recently viewed list, and it doesn't appear in her all accounts list view either. There's no Hello Friend account there. So I'm happy with that. That's worked. So let's try something else. We're going to go back to the Hello Friend account as Gemma. We're going to look at her related items. We're going to try and add Laura as an account team member and see what that does. So we're going to add the team member. We're going to find Laura, who was right there. Uh, we're going to add her as, uh, give her a role. And then we're going to give her read, write access to the account. and save. So now when we log in as Laura, we should be able to not only see that account, but we should also now be able to edit it. So let's have a look. So we go to the accounts, and Hello Friend is the most recently viewed account. So far, so good. So then if we edit it, and you notice the owner is still Gemma, we can add an account site and save it, and it's been successful. And that's all because Laura is on the account team. So now we're going to delete Laura. We're going to take her off the account team. And we're just going to double check that she can no longer see this account. It's because it's a partner account and she's not on the team anymore. So we can see it in her recent records, but uh oh, we can't get to it. Again, I'm happy with that. So that's the power of account teams and share and a criteria based sharing rule, coupled with the organization where default being set to private. Okay, now comes the fun. So those of you who've got your phones, you want to go into Safari or uh, whichever browser you prefer to use and just go to kahoot.it. And then when you're asked to, you can enter in the game pin. I'm just going to start the game off. You're going to really enjoy this. It's good fun. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Stephanie, actually. Stephanie comes to the London User Group, and she told us all about this. It's just a fabulous game. So what it will ask you to do is just put in the pin. Oh, sorry, it's a different pin. 489739 is the pin. And it plays some crazy music. Anyone joining? Oh, hello, Mel. Yay, here we go. Any more for any more? Oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, let's just get, oh, we've got 10, got a few more. Anyone else want to come along? Okay, let's get started then. 
Thank you. So this is basically six questions. We have a quiz based on what you've learned today. So accounts are private, but owners work with a telesales user. How can we make sure they have access? And you just hit the right symbol on your phone for the answer. Again, the question is, accounts are private, but owners are working with a telesales user. How do we make sure the telesales user has access? Okay, time's up. The right answer is to add the telesales user to the owner's default account team. That's absolutely correct, well done. So congratulations to Randy who got 678 points for that question. Michelle came second and Helen came third. Next one, we're up to a thousand points. What's the best way to give a new user access to accounts data in private sharing? You can have two possible answers here. Oh, well done. So two answers. The correct answers were you can have a sharing rule that grants access to a public group and you can have a public group containing that person's role and subordinates. Well done, everybody. So Randy, again, you're top of the charts. Okay, question three. Users are stealing leads. We don't want to produce duplicate leads. So which OWD should you choose? There are two answers. Very good. So the right answers were you can set leads to public read only with transfer refer record false um, on the permission set, or you can have um, leads set to um, public read only with the transfer record set to true. I'm sure it's not right. Anyway, apologies. Uh, okay, next question. Finance person needs to see a very private record as a one off. What's the solution? It's a one-off share. There are two possible answers, but only one, but we're asking which one is the best. Yes, congratulations, we manually share the record. Congratulations, Michelle, you smashed that one. Okay, what's the difference between public read-write and public read-write transfer? Ten seconds. You can transfer cases or leads regardless of owner and without any other permission. So congratulations to Helen who smashed that one. Okay, question six, last question. Cases are private but account owners need to see them for their accounts. What solution is the best?
Congratulations. So you can set the cases to private, but what makes this really interesting is that when you create a sharing rule on your account object, you can actually define on the account um, what what cases, what level of sharing you want to put on the cases underneath the account, as well as putting them on the on the case object themselves. Okay, so let's have a look. So Helen, you came top, followed by Michelle, and followed by just a girly geek. So congratulations, everybody, and thank you so much for playing. Um, I will save those results later on. Okay, uh, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed that. It's a really, really good app. Um, are there any questions that we can take at all? Um, please d don't. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions that you like. I'll just see if I can get to the chat. Q and I. Okay, um, well, if anybody has any questions that occur to you, if you have any questions that come back to you later on, please feel free to tweet me or send me a message, um, and I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. You can also put them in the comments on the YouTube. Um, so some great resources that you can use. Um, there's a really, really good um, blog that I found today called Behind the Scenes of Record Ownership in Salesforce, and that really helps to um, understand exactly what's going on um, under the bonnet in terms of the record ownership. We also have the architecture trail mix on Trailhead. Um, and we have two really excellent uh, white papers from Salesforce. So there's record level access under the hood. Um, shout out to Andrew Hart, my boss, who sent me a copy of that today or referred me to that today when he was checking my presentation. Um, we have a guide to sharing architecture as well, which is an excellent resource that you can use for studying for your exam. And then I've put on my blog, um, on my personal blog, there is a, a post about sharing and visibility exam tips. So I hope you find that helpful as well. Um, thank you very, very much for coming, everybody. Um, if you want to get involved, we primarily work on our community group. That's where we keep the conversations going. But we're active on Twitter. Um, and we also have a website, um, archladies.com. And on this website, we've got quite a few goodies that you can look at. So we have um, all of our recorded sessions. We recently did a mock review board that are there that's that's posted there. And on the right hand side, you can go through all of our uh, study group recordings. We also have uh, a section where you can get inspired. So we've got two podcasts out that you could listen to. Um, we also have member stories. We like to get to know all of our people as part of our group. Um, so if you want to get involved, please do tell us your member story so that we can feature you on our website and, and tweet you out. Um, if you do tweet, we have two hashtags that we regularly use. We have Ladies Be Architects and we, or we have Journey to CTA. Um, and you can mention us on Twitter if you like um, through our Arc Ladies. Um, here's our Twitter feed. We're fairly active on there. And there's myself and Charlie who have access to that account. Um, and then other things that you can do is come and see us. We have got um, a few events that we're going to. Um, so Charlie is going to be speaking at Force Landia. And we are, we've got some amazingly exciting um, sessions planned for Dreamforce this year. So really looking forward to that. We're also going to Inspire East in Cambridge in the UK in October. And Charlie will also be talking about the architect journey at Florida Dreaming. And then I'm off to Paris in November. And then for next year, we, all, we already have one event for next year, which is the brand new Year Dreaming event, which is going to be in Brussels. And it's the first Benelux um, event. So I'm really excited to be going to that as well. Um, so you can come along and, and, and watch our sessions. And um, we also have a swag store. So if you want to buy a t-shirt or a hoodie or a phone case or a notebook, you, you're more than welcome to do that. And you can get to it through our website. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. If you've got any feedback, then that is more than welcome. Always looking to improve. Um, and if you are interested in running a study group of your own or perhaps volunteering to run one of the monthly groups so that you're not stuck with my voice all the time, again, we, we are all about 
um, giving you the opportunity to take part in the community um, and to blaze the trail for other architects um, and, and would-be architects. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and I really hope that you found this useful. Take care now everybody, bye-bye. <laughs>